don't have a lot of information yet. Um, it was Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday I got a Schumacher down here because we realized we had a problem. And we finally determined that it's the big cylinder that lifts the elevator, the casing that, that goes down in the ground as a whole. So it has to be replaced. It's going to be uh, very expensive. Uh, and he's going to email me the quote when he gets it all put together because he had he took all of the numbers from the elevator so that he gets the right part and everything. When they locate everything, then they will send me a quote so that we'll know a little more what it's going to be. It, it, it is going to be very expensive, but uh, they uh, we've, we've devised a way to come up with money, at least temporarily. And uh, I mean, later on, we'll be trying to get into your pockets, I'm very sure. But uh, just we're, we're working at it as quickly as we can, but the problem is it's probably going to be uh, at least a couple of months. I mean, time they find this stuff, and, and then when you say when you do come to work on it, uh, it'll be a five-day job. So it's, it's quite extensive. And uh, just wanted you to know where we're at on the elevator, that we're working on it, and we're going to get there. But it's going to take a little time. That, that elevator is 28 years old. Yes, 28 years old. So it's so, right. Count our blessings. Here's another guy. Man. He counts yeah. our, count our blessings. He said the worst one he ever saw was a pop hole in eight years. And this lasted 28. So we, we've done quite well. <coughs> okay. There you have it. Anything else? Kids going to have a birthday. Okay. Well, well, we want each and every one of you to call him up and sing happy birthday to him. <laughs> yeah, he would love that. Maybe at the very least, send Dick a card. You know, because Dick is affected by this elevator. He can come worship with us because of that. But I think maybe he can come to Sunday school. We have some Sunday school down in the library.
From the Book of Common Prayer for the third Sunday in Lent, let us pray. Almighty God, who sees that we have no power of ourselves to help ourselves, keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, we lift up here to you today. Uh, we lift up to you, Ruby's family here today, Lord, and, and just be with them and comfort them. We lift up uh, Don Schreiber's family at Patterson. And you do the same for them. Give them comfort, comfort and assurance. Uh, for my dad. And for everyone everywhere who has an ailment or an injury or uh, is suffering physically. We pray down your healing touch, Lord God. And we stand together in faith believing for healing. And now, Lord, may we draw closer to you this Lent season. Those things that need to leave our life, may we, we get rid of them. And those things that we need to add into our life that bring us closer to you, Lord God, we just uh, embrace those things this Lenten season. May we repent and may we turn to you, Lord God. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
hungry and he was tired. And then, all of a sudden, suddenly, the scripture says that angels appear. Last week, we talked about Nicodemus, where Nicodemus had this longing. He was a, one of the ruling class uh, in, the, in the temple, and uh, he was part of the uh, Supreme Court uh, of the temple, and yet there was something missing in his life, that he had the form of godliness, following the legalistic terms of the law, but he didn't have any power. And Jesus told him that you have to be born from above. We're talking there about a new, the new birth. A new, recreated, reborn spirit. And so today, we're going to talk about the woman at the well. And so we're going to, uh, uh, if we can bring up a map that we have. I think Megan's going to kind of work on that. Can you vamp for a second? What's that? Can you vamp for a second? We'll get yeah. to that. <laughs> so anyway, where this story starts, it starts really at a town near the River Jordan called Ana. A-E-N-O-N. Ana. And what is happening is he and John the Baptist are baptizing people together. And then he kind of moves out into the countryside um, there in uh, near Anan, and he's baptizing, but actually kind of things get a little hot. And so he is uh, trying to uh, get out of town, get out of Dodge, if you will. And so then you know, moving out into the countryside, but his disciples keep baptizing people. Keep, uh, and, and so this all just kind of works together uh, to where Jesus feels like it's now time for him <laughs> to go to Galilee from Anon. Well, part of the deal here is he doesn't go, it's not a linear trip. He doesn't go in a straight line from Anon to Galilee. We'll see here in just a minute, and I can kind of show you what we're talking about. Okay, so we've got the map up here, and uh, let's get my little pointer. Goes from up here near this this town right here. 
Right now, uh, Salem, Salome, can't read. It's right over here. And then he goes south down here to do Sychar. In Shechem, right here. And it's near this Mount Gerizim. This Mount Gerizim is a sacred place for the Samaritans. And uh, right here at Shechem and Sychar, this is where Jacob's well is. And so from there, then Jesus has got to go through the mountain range and then go north up to Galilee. So why would he go from up here, south and east, and then go north? Why would he take that kind of a trip? It's surely not linear. It's surely not the, the closest route. No. He goes and he... He travels <coughs> in this direction, and I think he has a reason for it. And I think the reason for it is provenient grace. Is God knows you before you know him. And Jesus is the Son of God. And I think he had this a divine appointment with this woman at Jacob's well. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well, and it was noon. So, now this Samaritan woman comes at noon. Now, when most people come to the well, it's in the early morning hours when it's cool and it's not so hot. It's a, it's a hot time to be drawing water and carrying it back to your home at, at noon. And so there's not very many people there. And, but she comes at noon, and guess what? Jesus is there, and he is waiting for her. And he asks her for a drink. So she says to him, how is it that you... A Jew asked a drink of me, a woman of Samaria. Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. And so then Jesus answers her and says, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. So where do you get that living water from? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and his sons and his flocks drank from it? And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming to draw this water. Well, Jesus does something that is a little peculiar. Uh, I think he knows what's going on with this woman, just like he did with Nicodemus. He knows what's in her heart. He knows what she's longing for. And he understands her. He meets her at this well, just as she is. But he accepts her as she is. 
But he doesn't want to just leave her there like that. He doesn't want to leave her in the same state that he found her. So he says to her, you go get your husband and bring him back here. And she says, well, I have no husband. And he says, well, Jesus told her, well, you know, you uh, are speaking correctly. In fact, uh, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. And she said to him, what you have said is true. Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. You see, to the Samaritans, Mount Gerizim was a sacred place. And Jerusalem was the sacred place for the Jews. And Jesus responds to her, there is a time coming when uh, you'll no longer worship here at this mountain or in Jerusalem, but you will worship God in spirit and in truth. And she goes on to explain to him, and she, he goes on to explain to her that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Jesus has revealed himself to her because she responds, you know, I know that the Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus says to her, I am he. I am the one who is speaking to you. So then here come the disciples. And they were surprised that he was talking to her. And, um, but they knew enough to keep their mouths shut. And, um, why are you speaking with her? They didn't ask the question, why are you speaking or what do you want? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. And you know what? Those very people that she wanted to avoid, she invites them to come see a man. Come see a man who knows everything about me. Could he actually be the Messiah? And the people in town all came to see Jesus. What has this got to do with us here today? You know, uh, as I said before, Jesus made this trip in a roundabout way. That's convenient grace. Convenient grace. Jesus knows us before we know him. And he's wooing us. He's drawing us closer. He knows what's on our thought, hearts and minds at all times. And yet, you know, I have to tell you, just like Jesus, I have gone through wilderness times, and I have been tempted, and I have come through those wilderness times, as many of you have, and suddenly angels have appeared. Uh, I have been like Nicodemus, where I uh, wanted, just wanted to come to Jesus at night, when there was such a longing in my heart and my mind for Jesus that I needed to be told that you need to be born anew. I've been through all those struggles. And yet, there are times where I, you know, as much as I like to be with people, I think I'm a people person. There's times I want to withdraw from people. You know, if your wife says to you, uh, were you going to the grocery store today? That's a pretty good indication that you're going to go to the grocery store. <laughs> if 
I go to Walmart at Bethany, invariably, I know so many people that are in They either come to Canesville or Eagleville or somewhere around Bethany and, you know, and then people have got all kinds of questions for you. So I have to tell you, there's times when I just want to avoid all that and go at a time when there's not a lot of people in the grocery store. You know, because people are curious and they don't mean any harm by it, but they want to ask questions about your family and, and all that. And, and that's not a bad thing at all. But sometimes I just want to get in and get my milk and bananas and whatever else I need to get and get out. And get out and not see anybody and not have to talk to anybody. So there it is. Uh, I don't know if any of you are like that or not. I have heard that Bob Calderberg likes to volunteer going to the grocery store because it's a social time for him. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Uh, in those times, when you don't want to be around people, and this is why we ask these questions in our small groups, is where have you seen God this week? Is because we want you to be on the lookout for God. Because it just might be that Jesus makes a detour to encounter you. It just might be that you might be going through a dry time and you want to come to the well and you've got uh, you know, to draw that water out of the deep well and it takes so long, but then Jesus shows up on the scene and you have an encounter and who knows what that might be. You know, this last week for me, uh, Friday, Becky and I took care of our grandkids. And, she, and, and I felt like God showed up. We had such a good day. And then with my dad, my two brothers were not scheduled to be there. But they both just happened to come and visit them and were able to help my, my folks. Folks, that's, that's God's hand. Uh, and neither one of them were... You know, they both took time out to detour. Jesus showed up. It is with us to be open to the Holy Spirit, to be open to Jesus, that when we do such a, a little task like this woman here was drawing water for her household, we may be going to the grocery store. Who knows where you might be? Honor the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what? You may start out from the house uh, sort of grouchy and grumpy and uh, you don't want to see people or talk to people. And then all of a sudden when Jesus shows up, you have this wellspring of joy that comes deep from within. Just as Jesus talked to Nicodemus about a new reborn, recreated spirit to be born from above that this wellspring of joy from the inside comes gushing out. You see, Jesus wants to meet us where we are. And he accepts us for who we are and where we are. But he doesn't want to leave us there. So that is my charge to you this week too. Be on the lookout for where you might see Jesus in the most unlikely of places. And be open to the Spirit of God because the time is now that we worship our God in spirit and in truth. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, come and 
see a man who knew everything about me. Come and see a man. Amen. <coughs> Our final hymn is Fill My Cup, Lord, number 641, Stand at Your Able.